All right. Uh, I'm pretty sure I will go over time. Uh, that's happening <laughs> to me every time, so I'm trying to go as fast as I can because I think the later content is more recent and more interesting. But uh, if you've never been to my talk, I think there are a few things that you should know me for. Uh, I am, you know, I'm not just the flow guy. Uh, I also like to talk about video game through the lens of emotion. Uh, you know, I like to look at games from how it makes me feel. Um, and I think ultimately, if, if you care about entertainment, uh, that is the food industry for feelings. Um, you know, you, we have desire for, we have cravings for food and drinks, and we also have cravings for feelings. Um, and uh, various uh, medium, uh, books, uh, roller coaster rides, and movies, they provide different type of emotional experience for us. Uh, and we have a very wide uh, variety of different tastes of what kind of stuff we like. Uh, and in the movie industry, uh, you know, earlier we were talking about video game genres, you know, what is Zelda, you know, Versus of the Wild. In the movie industry, they figure it out, you know, just as I mentioned, like, honey, what kind of mood are you in? Let's watch a film. Uh, do you want something scary? Do you want something funny? You want something romantic or something exciting, right? Whatever emotion you want, there is a market for it. Uh, on this very pie chart, the size of the pie indicates how much, how big, you know, how many people want an emotion uh, in those fields. On the contrary, when people think about video games, and particularly the genre of video games, people don't really think about feeling. They more think about uh, real-time strategy, uh, turn-based strategy, uh, first-person shooter and third-person shooter, online-person shooter, massive multiplayer online shooter. These genres are uh, all based on software features because game originally come from software industry. But if you actually want to use the same pie chart because that indicates the emotional needs of our society and you start to map video game into the emotional needs, uh, I find a lot of the games I grew up playing all fit into the action adventure thriller genre, which are more of the kind of direct emotion and they're very strong and, and primal. Um, but I haven't really, played many comedy games. Uh, I've played games with very funny dialogue, but the, the gameplay is not funny. Uh, one fu funny game I played was Katamari Damacy. As I play, I have this you know, grin on my face. Uh, but there's just not a lot of games there. Um, you know, we, we might say, hey, you know, drama, you know, um, you know, we all played all the Japanese RPGs. They must be drama, right? But if you really think about the gameplay of those games, they are more of a kind of growth and combat system. You know, if that's what you play. The drama you experience in Final Fantasy VII, and many people cried for it, including me, is actually cinema. You know, it's the dialogue, it's the performance, it's the animation, it's the music, but it's not game, it's cinema. Um, in terms of gameplay, the things that makes me feel like drama, I, I, I would say it's very rare. Um, anyway, so this is a chart uh, done by the uh, British, uh, uh, film industry. So they were trying to map what men and women prefer in terms of emotion genres. And also at the top is the younger age and the bottom is the older age, right? The, to the left side it's men, to the right side it's women. And uh, the distance of any emotional genre, uh, if something is very close to uh, let's say male uh, 15 and 24, they love horror games. If you if you look at who's playing Slender Man or Friday uh, Freddy's, they are all kids. Um, and on this chart, you can also say, well, what does man hate the most in terms of emotional experience? Uh, you know. And last time I went to see a romantic film, actually don't remember when. Um, Anyway, so this is a chart that I find very, very useful because you know, even though it is talking about film, but it is talking about the emotional needs that the, pr the preference uh, from the average uh, demographic. Uh, and I want to point out pretty much everything in the male category, um, you know, horror games, uh, sci-fi games, action adventure games, thrillers, any comic hero based games, they are already very, very saturated. I mean, if you think about all the console games, 
um, each of these genre will have at least two, sometimes three AAA games that is competing for, which is a very saturated market. Um, but on the rest of the dots, um, you know, romantic games. Uh, I, I, I haven't played many games that made me feeling romantic. There are dating simulators, but they are strategy games or simulations to make you, you know, uh, optimize your numbers so eventually you get to date. Uh, if it's from Japanese, then you might see the girl's panty if you are doing well with the numbers. But, but there's nothing to do with feeling romantic. Um, I've played one game that is uh, falling to the, the female category, which is called uh, Sims. It's part of the family genre. It's simulating the family dynamic, right? It's one of the very few uh, PC game that is a majority woman. Um, and this chart summarizes very well. Like uh, As I grew up, uh, when I was in the Nintendo era, I was playing games with you know, male, female equally. Uh, but as soon as it goes to the, the next generation where games become 3D, there's a very quick job of uh, female players. With one exception, Dance Dance Revolution and Guitar Hero. I played those games with women, not men. And those are fitting into the musical category. Um, anyway, I think this chart is brilliant and uh, it, it really helped me to understand the type of content the game industry is missing. Uh, and I feel like right now, console industry is super left-handed. Uh, and that's also why there's a lot of male uh, players and developers, but you know, not that many female ownership of consoles. Um, and because I felt it's left-handed, or it's, it's like if this is a food industry, all we are serving is beef patties, right? There's not enough salad. And, and so when I was thinking about uh, building games, what would be the most useful games to help to grow this industry, to have more people to love the industry, is to, um, you know, kind of venture out and to make games that bring emotions that is not commonly uh, seen within the game industry. Uh, and I thought it would it would be helpful to grow the industry, but also it would help for would be helpful for people who play games. If all you play is action and and shooting, it would be nice to every now and then play a game that makes you feel. Um, so when we uh, started that game company, uh, we spent weeks to discuss what is the mission statement of the company. Um, and eventually these uh, four words, originally it was three words, um, because we haven't made online game when we first founded the company, but timeless, uh, we want to make games that does not age uh, as the technology changes. So we, 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 do, we do not want to chase fad. Um, <coughs> positive emotional experience because there's plenty of games that's already you know uh, dealing with you know anxiety violence and anger and we wanted to do something that feels that make people feel good and we feel like that is the area where games are still lacking uh, and then all ages um, I, I hate to hear people say games are for kids because uh, I grew up with games games helped me to uh, you know, not only helped me to open an eye to the world, to learn many things, and also helped me to find friends who have come an interest and eventually bonds me with the coworkers to build the company. Games is everything to me. It's, uh, it's someone, something that grew up with me. Uh, and it's very sad to see, you know, the people who I grew up playing games with telling me that I just don't have time for games. Uh, you, know, I, you know, it's not for me anymore. It's for my kids. And I want the game still to stay relevant uh, to all of us. Uh, yeah, even though we have won some Guinness Awards for having too many trophies, uh, what I'm most proud of, of what we did with the company, is to expand games into the realm of art. Um, you know, at the school, we, you know, we get our Master of Fine Arts degrees. But the entire uh, three years while I was in the film school, people are debating whether video games can be art whether video games can make you cry. Um, and I, I'm just really happy to see that games can be shown in a museum and gallery um, and could be nominated for a best soundtrack for Grammy. Um, you know, that's what, what I see as hope that you know, we can go beyond just 
the stereotypes. Um, in order for people to be able to play games uh, in a non-gaming setting, um, we have, we've, we've done a lot of work to simplify how uh, easy it is to pick up the game. Um, and we wanted to have not just gamers, but also non-gamer to be able to experience our uh, games. Um, especially because we introduce a new type of emotion and that tend to attract people who may not be a gaming audience and they have very little uh, motor skills and gaming knowledge before. Um, this is my favorite uh, video um, because uh, it was not only uh, shot uh, as a trailer for a video game documentary, uh, the, the people who cut this teaser told me they managed to get these shots by mounting uh, our flower game on top of the camera uh, so they, they can have these, uh, uh, you know, contemporary art museum people to play the game. Initially, I was like, you, must, you guys must have hired the actors because gamers don't look like these people. Uh, and I also like, are they just kind of acting, uh, you know, pretending something's happening? But later, uh, when they actually show the controller, the controller is on, you know, the, the, the red light is there, so I know they are actually playing a PlayStation game. Uh, but the emotion uh, and the close-up of these people is, uh, is really satisfying because, you know, if you're a designer, all you care about is to elicit emotions. It's almost like video, video game porn, you know, for designers, right? It's like this slow motion close-up of your player's emotional response. It's very satisfying. Uh, and uh, the, this is another video that I really liked. Um, this is a child with Down syndrome, so they, they, their, their brain development is slow. They couldn't really pick up words and learn to read. So his, his older brothers, who doesn't have the Down syndrome, told us that he couldn't really play any RPG games, but he could play uh, the flower game and actually enjoy it because you know all you need to do is tilt the controller and you squeeze and you get wind. Um, and, and that's all you need. Um, and uh, this is an email I received uh, on a Christmas day. Um, uh, this, this is a veteran from Afghanistan. He uh, told me, you know, in the email how much he hated his life. He's, he's, he, he, does, he lost his, both of his legs, he has kidney stones, and he has brain injury. And, you know, he said he, even though he has a girlfriend, he's thinking about, you know, uh, not wanting to live. And then, then he told us that he played Journey, and somehow it gave him, I guess the emotional impact, gave him hope. Uh, and uh, the fact he said, um, someone over there made my life better through the creation of this game. Um, someone deserves my gratitude in a grand way. That, that was really, I think why I make games, um, to make people's life better. Uh, this, is a, this is a story that I shared back in 2013. A uh, little girl who played the game with her, her father uh, at the last few months of his life because he had a stage four cancer. And you know, many months after when the girl replayed Journey and she suddenly get what the game is about. And uh, I wouldn't expect someone at you know, uh, 15 would be able to understand what the message of journey is, but she was able to understand that and she was able to understand what it meant for, for death and what comes after death. Um, and so, so as we are making these games, we start to realize that games are not just, you know, a time waster. If you create an emotional impact, it could be therapeutic to people. and It could change people's life. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, the biggest thing that I've ever heard ever after we made all three PlayStation games is that uh, I want to share this game with my friend, but I, they don't have a PlayStation. Uh, I want to play this game with my daughter, but we don't have two PlayStations. Um, you need to show this game to more people. You need to share this game with more. And so what I thought about is if we could turn um, that emotional uh, experience that could be achieved on console and share it with you know the the tablet the smartphone users we could change more people's impression on games um, 
So that's why we started working on Sky ever since uh, Journey launched, and it's a seven year long uh, <laughs> uh, marathon. Um, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between Jer Journey and Sky. Um, a lot of people were asking me, why did you, where did you come up with your inspiration for, for Journey? Um, and a lot of people were also telling me your game felt very, very lonely. Um, and uh, I, I said, yeah, that's, that's because I'm feeling very, very, very lonely. Um, and, and because I'm so lonely that I wanted to uh, have this longing to connect with people. Uh, while I was uh, in graduate, graduate school, um, I, I have five different part-time jobs, and I also don't speak very good English. So in, in America, it was very difficult for me to have any friends. Um, and during that time, uh, my only uh, leisure time is, is play uh, World of Warcraft. I actually get to play World of Warcraft since Alpha. So uh, my friend works in Blizzard, so I get to test, Alpha test their game. And I really felt that was an amazing world where nobody's judging me based on my economic status, because at the time I was dead poor. Um, nobody's judging me based on my race, because they couldn't see it. I'm just a female orc. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And so I was playing the game, looking for connections with people. Um, and the problem with World of Warcraft is, there are many times it, it kind of teases me, because you, you're waiting for a raid to start, and you start talking about life. You start to build sympathy with each other. And, but then once the raid starts, they were like, all right, no love, let's just talk about you know, DKP. You're gonna stand here, you're gonna move over there. You know, have you been performing? You know, what's your healing status? And uh, that was basically like a mili military drilling, right? And then after the raid is over, I'm like, finally, we can talk. Then they're talking about, well, whose chances to get the loot, right? Like, let's roll dice, see who wins the loot. And once the person loot the, win the loot, and they all just vanishes, you know? And uh, sometimes I would have a friend, but then once they turn out I'm not female, uh, then the conversation stops. Uh, sometimes I would hop on Ventrolo back then. Uh, it's uh, the voice chat. Uh, and then they can tell that uh, I don't speak good English and they didn't want to talk to me. Um, and so my various hope of that maybe I will find a true friend in World of Warcraft has failed, um, which made me have this very strong emotional desire. I have this craving. I wish I could be accepted. Uh, I wish I could connect with people so I'm not alone. Uh, so I started to make painting. Uh, so this is a painting I did uh, back in 2006. This is way before I started my company to make Flow Flower and then eventually come back to Journey. Uh, but I'm daydreaming about this online world uh, <laughs> where uh, people are not judged by their gender because they are all wrapped up in robe. Uh, they are not judged by their age, their race. Um, they are seen by each other as pure human being. Uh, in this scene that I, I dreamed of, uh, someone was standing on a bridge, looking down into a beautiful uh, grand waterfall. Uh, I happened to be the one on the left, and uh, I, I come next to him, and I was like, hmm, he's, he's not moving. What is he thinking? Is he simply admiring the beauty of the nature, or is he waiting for someone? Is he looking at a secret path underneath the, the waterfall? My imagination started to flow. I start to project him. Maybe he's just enjoying the view. But hey, here I'm, I am. I'm standing next to this person. Both of us are here enjoying the grand view of the world. And as, at that very moment, I felt a sense of connection that I'm not alone. Someone was here with me in this giant world. Um, so then I started to dream about, oh, I'm gonna form a team with this person. Even though we don't speak, uh, we could travel around. Uh, and uh, in the distance, there's a, a different group. They are wearing red robes, uh, you know, and uh, it's people who form a meaningful bond and they're traveling together. And it's just like our life. We, we come through this world alone and at various times, we find someone special, so we start travel together. 
we may not finish the whole journey, but we could eventually break up. Maybe later we will re reunion, but all of us are searching for something in life. You know, th that ultimate answer, why are we here? Um, and I was dreaming about this on online world where everyone is searching for the meaning of their life, and they're searching for a, a path, uh, a place where, 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 where the answer resides. Um, as I start to think deeper about how can I escape loneliness, uh, I start to think about not only do I want to uh, uh, be with someone, I wanted to be trusted by someone. Uh, so this is a scene uh, of these, uh, these black pillars are the giants. They're walking through a snow field in a mountain. And so they kicked up all the, all the snow, so it's very foggy. Uh, you couldn't really see what's in the front. And you're going to be worried that the, the giants are going to stomp on you and kill you. So you have to hold the hands of someone who's leading you in the front trusting that he's going to lead you to safety. But at the same time, you are trusted by someone behind you that you know, they're completely depending on you. And that is the moment I felt like that's when I can truly escape the sense of loneliness. You know, well, I have unconditional trust to the people next to me, but also the unconditional trust from the people behind me. Um, and this is all just subjective. It's just my feeling. There's no science to say if this is going to help you to escape loneliness. Um, but I feel it's the right way, because I'm intuition-driven people. Um, and then I start to work on journey. Um, I was trying to you know, build our first online game where I want to take a step at that, because this is like three years after I made those paintings. Uh, and, and finally, we get to uh, make a game where we can do online. Uh, and I looked around at the online games. You know, they are either fighting each other or fighting something together. Um, it's never about the relationships. Uh, you know, I think it's really like people are talking about social games. Um, I mean, but really, they are farming simulators where you can click on numbers. But I was hoping a social game where I can feel truly not alone. Um, and I happened to uh, talk to an astronaut who told me this kind of uh, mysterious stories about how all 19 astronauts who has landed on the moon uh, just mysteriously all become very faithful and you know religious after they come back you know they are all very kind of hardcore scientists they call the mission specialists who goes to the moon um, and somehow after they come back you know they they transform um, and uh, I, I later ran into the, the man who uh, drives moon buggy. Uh, he's the first man who drives a vehicle on the moon. I asked him, I said, what is on the moon? Why is everybody coming back changed? Um, and he said the moon is the world's most boring place that he's ever been to, because there is absolutely no color, because everything is gray, and they all find dust. He said, you couldn't even find a tiny rock, because it's just dust. Um, and in this colorless world, there's no sound. Uh, the only thing interesting in the universe is the Earth, and you can block it with a single uh, uh, sound. And so when you remove that, then you are in the, the world's most boring, empty space, and you have to start to think, why the heck am I here? You know? Why are we on that tiny marble? Why not anywhere else? You know, what is the purpose of all this space? You suddenly start to get overwhelmed with the sense of, you know, you, <laughs> I, I don't know anything. I, I'm just a tiny speck in this universe. The planet I grew up on is as small as my you know, fingernail. I really don't know why. Um, and this is an emotion called awe. Oh, a W E, and it's an emotion that we are currently very lacking because we are in, living in an empowered world where we are powered by information. We are moving over 80 miles per hour. We are living in the clouds. We are talking to anybody anywhere. We can search for any answers, uh, any questions, and we'll get answers within milliseconds. So when is the last time we felt that we're so tiny, we're so small? that we don't know anything. And 
this also reflects in the culture of video games, even film, right? Like all the characters is representation of uh, power fantasies. Um, and when you are playing a game where you're feeling the emotion of empowerment, um, your first reaction to the other person is, how am I apply my power onto this other person? It's, the gun is in my hand, so why not use that, right? Um, and so even if you are fighting with someone together, it's more about, well, what kind of things that that's gonna grow my power, right? The, the, the power curve of growth in RPG, that's what people mostly think about, the loot. Um, and that's the moment I felt we have to reverse the emotions that the online games typically portrays just to give it a chance so people can connect. Most of the online games empowers the player, you slaughter anything in your way and you go there to loot, right? And why would I bother uh, you know, teaming up with anybody, right? Um, some of the online games have bosses, so they change the power dynamics, right? Suddenly you are the weak ones. Um, and then you are more likely to talk to other players to team up. Um, and most of the online games are so much focusing on the power uh, cycle, right? The, the, the loop of the rewards it's to grow your ability so you can kill even more powerful foes. Um, and loot is more important in World of Warcraft than people. Like, it doesn't matter. That's why there's ninja looters. Um, and, but what about we reverse that, where the game might have something to loot, but it's more about the people you meet. Um, you know, in a game that I, I truly expect to be not alone, I want to meet the player, I want to say hello, you know, how are you feeling? But most of the games don't even give you the chance, you know, and you already are dead. Um, and in most of the action games, trying to connect with somebody is so difficult because you're constantly distracted by actions uh, and sound around you. So it's just, you can't even focus on the person. So if you remove all those, things, um, then there's still too many people. Like, you, you know, I'm an introvert, so I'm only good at talking to one person at a time. I'm not good at three people talking and trying to understand what's going on. So I was thinking, well, maybe uh, I should put these people in a kind of harsh environment where they felt small and not really understand where the nearest home is, and then reduce the number of them you know, if you're trapped in a, in, a, in a desert for days and you stop, so finally you run into somebody, you're like, oh my God, finally another human being. I love this person so much, right? But if you're in the middle of Times Square, if you want to stop somebody, they will think you're trying to rob them. Um, so like these feelings are very, very important because they affect how you think about other people. Uh, even though I mentioned the emotion uh, called the awe, uh, what's more important is when you feel small, when you feel lonely, when you feel you don't understand the world, you feel vulnerable. And vulnerability is a key emotion for you to be able to have an intimate connection with others. And most of the video games don't want to make you vulnerable. They want to make you feel powerful and invincible. And that's, you know, what, what every boy's dream, uh, power fantasy. Um, Anyway, so as I was working on journey, I started to realize it's so important uh, to make the player feel small and feel vulnerable. Um, and it's very difficult because you know our the type of game we play, we grow up with, are all power fantasy games, and so it's it's like we have this uh, habit of making the game more fun, right? Making the game have more feedback. Um, and so many of my uh, game design habit tends to uh, kind of stir against the feeling of vulnerability. Uh, and even if we do have an occasional connection with somebody, it's very easy to break that. Um, so I will talk a little bit about, you know, some of the distractions that, that will f kind of distract you from connection. Uh, so this is the interface of Journey. Uh, the UI of Journey is no UI, uh, <laughs> so I can skip this whole conference. Uh, and uh, what happened is uh, people start to say, hey, it's an online game, you should give us names, right? And the problem with names is once people can write something, they immediately 
bring something that doesn't belong to your game into the world. I mean, if, you, if someone named themselves Donald Trump, I don't think there's going to be a meaningful connection right there, and the vulnerability is com completely gone. Uh, the second problem is almost all console multiplayer game requires voice over IP. Um, and everybody I run into said, I don't want to, I don't want to talk online. You know, I don't want to be yelled at by 10 year old kids, right? Um, I don't want to know who is playing behind the screen. Um, and then, uh, PlayStation uh, was forcing us, they were like, hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta add other people as friends, cause that's how you can viral the game. You gotta allow people to invite friends so they can play with each other. Uh, our problem is, if you actually play with someone you know, uh, you would actually um, have a lot of the, the complaint, like how come there, there is no voice chat? Uh, how come there's no text chat? How come I couldn't see my friend's name? Um, and PlayStation has this feature where you can, uh, as soon as you are connected with somebody, this person's name would show up in the PlayStation cross media bar. So you can immediately uh, decide if you want to add this person as a friend. Um, and uh, you know, this is kind of how we actually hide all the names. We have to change the you know, PlayStation um, you know, API to hide all the names so people can't be interrupted and have a false judgment on who this other person is. But eventually, we show them in the credits. Uh, if someone's called Funky Bottoms, uh, I probably wouldn't be playing with him. Um, but you know, during journey, I don't know. And I had a meaningful experience with them. Um, the second distractions I, I, I really love to share the story is just how tricky the human mind works. Uh, so initially, like any games, most of the games have a resource and people love to collect more resources because it allows them to do interesting things. And in Journey's case, uh, the resource is uh, the cloth and it allows you to fly. Uh, so people love cloth. Um, and the problem is, as soon as we created that, where well, you can pick up a cloth and fly, uh, our testers start to tell us how much they hated each other. Uh, they were like, I would rather play the game al alone. I don't want another player in my game because they're just stealing my resources. And uh, I was hoping to build a game where I can connect with them. I could have a trust, I could have a friendship, I could fall in love with another person. Um, fear of someone stealing your money is not something I want to have in the game. So I started to work on, okay, how can I change the system? Maybe if I just make the, the material not, uh, not stealable, would that fix the problem? You know, what if every resources can be shared? I thought, well, that's the perfect communism, even though it's never true in China. Um, and uh, then we, we literally changed the system. So any cloth you use that you fly, uh, you would actually leave it behind you so other people can use it. So no, there's no real stealing, right? Because even after they use it, you can still reuse what they have uh, been doing. Um, so, so, so that's what I was thinking. Like After I use it, the resource will drop on the ground. Uh, we even built a prototype uh, during the first uh, year of journey, so they look nothing like the final product. But okay, as you can, can see, you the person who flies, so I can use uh, they, they, they leave a trail of resources, so the, the people behind them can still pick it up, and you know, there they go, they share the same resource, they climb the tower. Um, but even with that, when resource can be shared, uh, people are still complaining about each other because if I gather the resource from very far and I take all the way from there over here so I can jump up and then the person next to me just take advantage of my fetching, they still consider I stole, uh, this person stole my time. And they still don't like each other. They were like, I just want to play the game alone. I always hated online player experience. You know, can you open a single player mode? And this is the first two years of journey, is just me fighting against tester telling me they don't want to play multiplayer games. Um, and so eventually, um, I, I, I start to change the idea. I start to make the resources not a limited resource. It's abundant resource. So it's like infinite uh, cloth. Any cloth you touch gives you full power. Um, and suddenly,
the relationship between people changed. They, they come to this place, they come here to charge their flying power, and they say, hey, oh, you're here to charge the power, just like me, you know? That's great, you know? <laughs> we, we love to find like-minded people, and they can both fly. And from that point on, people stop, stop saying that they don't, uh, they stop saying that they don't like, like other people in their game. Um, so as we were working on journey, we, we also wanted to see more intimacy between the players. And most of the online game, if you play, uh, you know, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, there's no physics, uh, there's no collision, you can run through anybody, it's very kind of a breaking immersion. Uh, we're working on a console game, so we were like, can we actually um, create a next generation fidelity of uh, people interaction with each other? And so, so we had this sketch where you know, two people can help each other to climb over something that's taller, uh, which one person cannot do. We even have the concept artist to do uh, you know, very uh, dramatic scene where you have to find a friend to uh, steal a treasure. Uh, but then what happened is after we implemented the ability of pushing people and you know, grabbing them, uh, just like human fall flat, um, people start to be naughty with each other. Instead of helping each other to climb top buildings, uh, they would actually push each other until one of them dies. Uh, and then they are very happy because in our game, if you do die, we will try to learn from Gears of War. Like if your buddy is dead, you can go to help them, right? Um, but what happened to our players, they just like to dance around the dead people. Uh, right, so they're like, I'm not gonna revive you, ha ha ha, right? So they, they like to do that, and especially my coworkers like to do that to me. I'm like, you guys know this is a game about making people trusting each other and helping each other to overcome difficulties. And you are here trying to like, grief me? Uh, and they loved my angry face, right? Because they got more feedback by dancing around. Um, and so for quite a while, I was depressed uh, when I was developing Journey, because um, I give up. I think maybe men are born to be evil, right? Um, and one day I ran to a, a child psychologist. I told her about my disappointment towards mankind. Um, and she said, oh, that's a simple problem. You're just describing the behavior of children. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, Children is always looking for maximum feedback because they are new to this world. They don't understand what is good, what is bad. They're just seeking for maximum feedback. And then she said, well, because you know, these players, they're not playing reality. They just come to this virtual world you just created. So they're technically babies. How would they know that seeing blood coming out is a bad thing? That, to them, that's a lot of pixel changed, right? Um, to them, seeing their coworker getting angry is a lot of feedback than just pushing their coworker onto a rock. So if you really want your kids to not do something, don't go to them and yell at them because they will perceive this as a maximum feedback. You just do nothing, right? Minimum feedback, then they're bored, then they stop doing what they, you don't want them to do. So then we switch back, uh, we bring back the perfect World of Warcraft collisionless you know, uh, game where even if you want to push someone off the, off the cliff, you will just fall off the cliff yourself, right? So there's no point of pushing people. Um, but this time I learned from my previous pro uh, uh, trouble, uh, this time I added something where if two people touch each other in journey, you get energy, you, you get to fly. So every person become a free ATM. So suddenly everybody's like, oh, I love to have another player to be with me. I like to stay around the other player because you know, there's positive feedback about what you want them to do, which is stay close. And there's zero feedback for pushing people off the cliff. And then suddenly they all loved each other. They all you know, journey together in the game. Uh, it might appear to be very natural to you uh, <laughs> if you're playing a game. Uh, but it took us literally two years to arrive to that point. Uh, before that, people are always just like, I don't know if I want to play this game multiplayer. Um, and then uh, initially we were also having trouble determining how many people we want. Uh, my teacher, uh, Professor Tracy Fullerton, came to playtest and in the four player playtest, 
she said, I really don't like this game. I don't like to play with other players, even though we created all those mechanics. And she said, because I felt like the, even though it's four people, um, the three other people seems to always want to go to one place. They like to beat the game as fast as they could. But I just wanted to hang around and check out the environment. Uh, but when we initially made this game, just like any uh, game at its time, we think all four people has to clear the room to go to the next level. So that every time they're finishing level, there's a lot of social pressure. So, so Tracy is like, I, you know, I would rather play alone so I can explore this game. Um, and so eventually, you know, because of the you know, majority versus minority, and also just this is our first online game, we decided to go with just two players, so there's no uh, strong kind of uh, social pressures that you have to do something. Uh, but also, by watching Tracy uh, and also being the flow guy, uh, <laughs> I want to come back to the flow charts. So Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, and he wrote this book called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. I think if you haven't read it, it's a very short book. It's totally worth the read. Um, and this is the chart uh, which uh, we saw yesterday. Uh, but this is not the chart I want to talk about. There's a second chart, and, and most people don't know about. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the second chart is also about flow, but it's particularly uh, used for flow for, uh, how to say, teamworks. Because uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, and Mihaly, he spent most of the time researching sports. Um, so flow was described to an individual, like a person who's like s snowboarding or skiing. But he also do research on how does a basketball uh, team perform well. Um, and he talked about how each individual, when they collaborate with the group, if it's too much about just do what I tell you to do, right? You, you just dare to be a drone in a team. You fall out of the, this chart, you become uh, conformed to the group and you lose your self-identity. A lot of people quit in a group activity like that. Uh, or if it's too much about me, you know, if I'm Kobe Bryant, I'm the superstar and you guys are nothing, like I'm just the winner, that also creates a situation where the group uh, will eject uh, this type of people because that collaboration doesn't last. And so what I want to say is like every individual has a desire to want to be alone or want to be with others. Uh, if you're alone for too long, you, you have the craving of being with the group. And if you have been with the group but not have your self-identity, you would also crave to be alone. And so, so you have to find a balance uh, and so what my paper is about is that I think trying to let the machine to guess whether you are challenged or feeling the game is too easy is never going to be reliable. The most reliable person is your own choice and your own subconscious choice. If you felt a game is too hard, as long as the game offer you a choice to play slightly easier, uh, you would subconsciously make the choice. And my belief is by offering these choices uh, in, a, in a kind of like non-intrusive way, the player will fall into the flow. Um, and how does that work if it comes to socialization, right? Can I create choices for the player to decide whether he wanna play alone or whether he wanna stay with a group? Um, and so the drop in, drop out uh, server structure was invented just for Journey. Uh, before that, nobody has this term called drop-in, drop-out matchmaking server. So I wanted to create a situation which is like a blind date. You will be keep running to people one at a time uh, and trying to find if anybody who plays in a similar pattern as you are. Like Tracy's case, she likes to explore the, the, the corners and she doesn't want to just beat the story very quick, right? And naturally, she would run into more people because they are the one to explore all the corners because they are more prox uh, close to each other. And if the player leaves and walks away far enough, then the server just switch to the next person. Um, so in the end, the, the, the server matchmaking is all stealthy and it just all happens very naturally. If you stay with somebody uh, within a certain proximity, because that means you guys have the similar interest, you just keep playing this game. Uh, and some of the player find each other really compatible, they can play from the very beginning to the very end. Um, and 
you know, if you don't like the player, you decide to walk away, and then eventually you would run into someone. Um, so, okay, so that, that, that's the story I learned from Journey, and I think a lot of the design principles can be applied to other games if you want to create something that allow people to be vulnerable and allow people to be uh, connecting with each other. Um, and so after Journey, you know, it was actually quite difficult because we don't want to play a game where we can't get better. Uh, Journey's success was unexpected and it was a lot of stress to the team because like how can we do better? You know, from this point on we're gonna go downward, you know, <laughs> for the rest of our life. Um, and uh, so for a very long time I was thinking about how, I, how can I make a better game after Journey um, and I, I don't have answers. Um, eventually I realized that you know, if I want to improve, if I want to get better as a designer, I have to think bigger, I have to think about how can I create values beyond just individual game. Um, and this comes back to this chart I was talking about. Uh, how in the console industry there's so many games that is very saturated but there's not enough games for the rest of the, the field and my dream of regardless if you're young or old, men or women, there is always a game for you. Uh, there's so much space for us to go into. Um, but I don't think I'm a good romantic writer. Uh, I, I don't really feel like, I, I, you know, I don't even like to watch romantic film. I think uh, as far as I can go is this area. I can't really go all the way over there because, you know, that's console background is more on the action adventure. So this center area is very, very interesting because it's, uh, it's an area both men and women like uh, equally. Uh, and if you look at the blue circle and all the movie genres and the emotions, and you think about all the Pixar movies, uh, all the Disney animations, they all fall into this category. Uh, within Disney, uh, you know, I have friends in Disney, they talk about you know, they wanna hit all four of them, young, old, man, woman, right? They want a, a movie that brings not just the kids but the whole family into the theater. Um, and it, there's a lot of truth to the, the combination of the emotion because number one, fantasy. Uh, you know, fantasy tend to be more romantic. You know, compared to sci-fi, most of the sci-fi story is very bleak and uh, depressing. But fantasy world it tend to be romantic and optimistic. Um, and that's certainly more appealing to uh, the, the, the female side. And then uh, we have comedy. Uh, most of the Disney movie have a sidekick and the only function of the sidekick is to give you some laugh. So you can keep the kids awake because otherwise they might fall asleep if it's a pure adult art movie. Um, and then you have the art house indie genre. Uh, which journey kind of fits in uh, these, these emotional games. Um, and it's important because if the parents don't feel they are touched, then they think this movie is for kids only. It's the Saturday morning cartoon, but not a Pixar movie. Uh, you, you, you have to hit the adult at the emotional level, having a, a little tear of joy or sadness. Um, and then ultimately, uh, every Pixar or Disney movie is falling into the genre of drama. And drama is one of the fourth, uh, for huge emotional market and they're mostly designed for adults. And drama is this emotional roller coaster that portrays a character's transformation. Uh, and usually these transformations are not easy. You know, an underdog end up becoming a superhero to save the world. They have to go through so much trouble the, the roller coaster is ups and downs, right? And, but eventually, it's a story was to be told. Um, and many parents would find uh, the dramatic story of the main character's transformation can be used as an inspiration for the kids. Um, anyway, I spent a lot of time talking about Pixar, um, of Disney animations, um, because I felt like actually in this world where now gaming is bigger than anything, uh, any other entertainment medium. If you ever think about a family playing game together, 
uh, you can't really find a lot of uh, photos. Um, I, particularly in China, if I Google like you, uh, family and kids playing games together, I couldn't find a single photo. Because uh, most people just think games are for kids um, and they don't play with their kids, particularly in Asia. Uh, in America, we have a moment of uh, Nintendo Wii, right, where we, we have the commercial of a whole family sitting on the couch, looking at the screen, very excited. Uh, but the reality of today's family gaming experience is most of the people just talk about how much the phone makes them disconnected rather than, uh, you know, uh, connected as a family. And there are video games that is very good at keeping people connected. Uh, you know, Destiny or Call of Duty, a lot of people, co-workers, uh, classmates, they, they go home, they play this game to stay connected with each other. Uh, there are also games that's designed for kids to have a fun, you know, social experience, but in a safe environment. Uh, but imagine if you have a whole family try to play these type of game. Um, it's just not very fun. Um, and this kind of reminds me of the, the story of Disney and why he started Disneyland. Because uh, back then, uh, when uh, theme park was made uh, to attract tourists uh, and, and people to go there and spend money, they all target at kids. All the roller coaster rides are designed to have smaller seats so they can make more money each ride. Uh, and so adults just have to wait. You know, in the hot sun, there's no shades. They are starving, but there's no food for them. Most of the food are candy bars to attract kids. And so Disney was thinking, why isn't there a park that could allow adults and kids to have fun together? You know, have food where it's healthy and good and it treats everybody equally as the first-class citizen. Um, and I felt that's very true to the gaming industry today. You know, you, you either have kiddie games or you have a really adult-like game. Um, and I was thinking, what if we can build a game for family where parents and children can play together and they stay connected in the same world and they pay attention to each other um, and they will meet other family online in this magical world. Uh, and this world will be like a true theme park, and it has action, it has adventure, it has romance, it has something scary, it has something mystical, and something sublime. It has all the interesting uh, stimulation that no matter which member of the family come to the game, there's something exciting for them. But at the same time, my, my own experience making emotional journey, like uh, flower and journey, re relies on a linear structure so I can create a climax. Uh, but I figured it's possible to design a park where even though it's completely open, uh, you can still have a linear experience as you travel through the land. Uh, and if you have been to Disneyland, uh, I don't know how many of you have been there, but I cry every time I go to Disneyland when I see the fireworks. Because even though the park is open, the morning to the night is a linear experience. And they were so smart. Right before the fireworks, they stop all the rides. You can't do rides. You have to go to the center, which is this bottom pit, uh, where you have to wait, uh, anticipating. And so when the fireworks come, uh, it's really a climax. And they were so good at designing the park that the, the dialogue that showed up during the fireworks talks about dreams come true. And they, they built it with a theme. Because all the rides you take, you know, Pinocchio want to be a real human boy, uh, Little Mermaid want to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a human girl, uh, Peter Pan wants to, uh, you know, fly and grow up. And all of them have a dream. And at the very climax, they said, oh, you know, 50 years ago, there's an old man who had a dream. He wants to build a park that the family can enjoy together. And now you're standing in this park. I'm like, damn it. You know, it's like dream can come true. Like, it was so good. Um, and I was, I was thinking, like, why isn't that experience not possible for a video game? Uh, we all have you know, smartphone devices, we have consoles, you know, all the parents are growing up playing games, and why isn't there an equivalent experience? So, very early on when we make Sky, uh, we, we are already kind of, even though this is before we even figure out the look of the game, we know we want a game where 
a whole family is connected. Um, and, uh, you know, it could be played on any device you want. Um, and I want a game that can connect players, not just cross gender um, or race, but also generations. Um, and that's, that's my dream. Uh, and the Sky, uh, if you haven't played it, uh, these are not really interesting, but if you do play it, this is my inspiration. Uh, uh, this guy is uh, NC Wires, one of the most popular uh, illustrator of the time. The, so he did uh, the book cover for uh, Treasure Island. Uh, if you've read the novel, the, all the book cover is done by this guy. Uh, and he made this painting to uh, remember one of his favorite students who died at age 22 due to sickness. And he really thought that person is the protege of him. So you can imagine how much it felt for him to lose someone like that. To him, he's like a child. Uh, and so Anthony Wiles had five kids. Uh, and so he made this painting for the funeral of his favorite student. And the student in this painting was painted as the child. Uh, all his kids are very old by now, but he painted what he remembered them as the children. Um, and they are all looking into a magical world, and it's filled with wonder. And that's where he thinks his uh, favorite student uh, is heading to after death. Um, and it's a very sad story, uh, but this, this painting just uh, really hit me. And what I thought of, you know, initially when we first started Sky, we thought it was going to be a game where it's a bunch of uh, journey-like character, you know, maybe in their, age, you know, prime age. But after I see the painting, I felt like I want to try to make everybody children. Uh, because children is asexual. I don't want people to be labeled based on their sex. I also think old people has an inner child, right? Like in this world of Sky, Everyone is uh, the same. Um, we are all the children of who we are. Um, and uh, so for a while we were thinking, okay, you know, what, what is this game about? You know, you, you, know, you must be uh, some kind of uh, the inner child or the spirit of, uh, of everything alive on earth. Uh, you can fly out because we want to bring back my first game, Cloud, which you can fly. Um, and you can travel around the world to visit beautiful places, you know, maybe uh, from farmland to city. This is the time where I was trying to combine flower with, with cloud. Um, but the more I start to work on it, the more I start to think about this feeling of uh, connections uh, between family members and between... Uh, so, so I was hoping that, uh, you know, as I play the game, the character can become a bird, and the bird is flying through the sky, um, and eventually it reaches to the highest place uh, on Earth, which will be one of those uh, uh, tropical storms that shoots you up, you know, almost out of the uh, uh, atmosphere. Um, and I thought about each individual is like a, a bird wings or light, uh, but eventually to really create the sense of connections, you have to, uh, you know, make all the light coming together and form something bigger. Um, you know, something that connects all of us around Earth. Uh, and that's kind of like the initial inspiration, but the game changed quite a lot because halfway through, we put Journey on top of it. <laughs> uh, so, it's, uh, the final game is quite different. Um, and uh, so one of the biggest difficulties we run into, and the, the reason we spent seven years working on the game, is because halfway through the project, uh, we were told that nobody wants to pay for premium game on mobile. And uh, we were told that you have to go free to play. Uh, so Sky as a project uh, was basically a mystical exploration game that could attract to men and women. Uh, it has family-friendly content, no sex, no violence. Um, it used the deep emotional bonding of journey and hopefully to create something that if you play with your boyfriend or girlfriend or with your kid, that you could feel closer after playing the game. And then suddenly we were slotted in this thing where 
we have to monetize at some point. You know, there has to be a gift shop somewhere in the experience. Uh, but we want to do it ethically. We want to make it to not interrupt the connection between the people. And we spent the first year looking at all the free-to-play successful titles. You know, like they want us to, to model after them. And the emotions I felt when I played in those games um, was quite uh, opposite of what I hoped Sky is about. Um, like the moment I, I saw a, a deal, which is like 90% like discount. Uh, if you don't get this deal in the next five minutes, it's gone. Uh, and I feel both greedy because like, whoa, that's, that's a steal. I can steal something for so low price. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm over. Uh, but I don't want to feel like that next to my wife when I play this game. You know, I don't want to make it, but I buy a 90% discount hat and give it to my wife as a gift. And how is that going to make I look like? Uh, and meanwhile, I realized that by giving... Um, but, you know, like a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, red emotions are our desires, uh, very selfish desires. Um, and most people don't want to admit how much money they spend in these free-to-play games uh, because they feel shame to some point. Um, if I beat my friend in a, in a Candy Crush race because I buy, buy some tools, I wouldn't let my friend know because I want she or he to think that I win fairly and squarely. Uh, like pay to win, everybody thinks it's like the wrong thing to do. Um, but I'm mostly thinking about how am I going to feel if I'm going into this land with my family. I want to feel proud. I want to feel charitable. I want to feel compassion when I spend money. Uh, and eventually we find a, a model which is focusing on giving rather than buying things for yourself. Um, I also want to just point out if you're looking into free-to-play business models, um, there are many, many different models now, you know, from the very hardcore SLG PVP, which each individual will pay over $6,000, but there's not many people who can afford to play this game, to the very, very cheap like, puzzle game like Candy Crush, where each individual don't pay much money, but the game is so accessible so they can kind of fill up the, the chart with a massive amount of users. And we were just looking at this chart, we were like, where do we stand? You know, I don't want to charge a kid $6,000 for a game. That just feels wrong. Um, but, you know, what's the right price? Um, for me, I think the right price is $60 because that's where I come from, from console. I feel that's the value of, you know, how much a good game should be cost. Um, and so then, you know, with this price range and with the feeling of giving, we've been honing on what uh, the, the monetization of Sky could be. Um, but since I'm running out of time, uh, I, I don't know how, how I'm supposed to close this. Um, if, <laughs> if you haven't played the game, uh, you know, okay, I would just say, if you haven't played the game, uh, this is a game about friendship. And uh, in this game, everybody is a children of the light. And your, your goal is to, uh, uh, sorry, also the story is told without words, but you know, through the environment and the, the characters. Um, and your goal is to find the fallen stars, which they would actually appear as spirits scattered around the world. And you find them and save them and to put them back into the sky and turn into the stars. And the world has seven different land. Uh, each has very distinct feelings and gameplays. Um, and it, just like a journey, there's something very challenging near the end. Um, and this game is about building relationships. You know, in most of the RPG games, you level up yourself. But in Sky, you level up the relationship. Uh, and you learn new, new skills. Uh, you earn cosmetics by building relationships rather than spending money to buy things. Um, and uh, some of the part of the game require collaboration, some of them are very difficult, you better go with a friend. Uh, the game can support up to eight players simultaneously, um, and it's a game that's constantly updating because it's just like a real theme park. We are doing, you know, content every two months. Uh, I want to share a couple of stories that I gathered from Sky. 
Um, this first story is a story about spreading love. Um, a 67-year-old uh, grandma uh, from Hawaii wrote this email to me. And she has quite a few spell errors, but um, and she talked about how she never played a game, but she discovered it on the App Store. And by running to friends who helped her to travel around the world. I, I don't think 67-year-old can do very well in a 3D environment and remembering which direction to go. So I, I really think his friend, her friend did a lot to help her through the game. Um, and uh, she cried twice at the lowest moment of the game and the highest moment of the game. Um, what I really find surprising is uh, she talked about how at age 67, she, the game helped her to realize there's still love that she's capable of. What, which initially I was like, what, what is she talking about? Love. And, and then I started to think about what a 67-year-old's life condition is like. She probably is lonely. Uh, she probably thinks love is for the young people. Uh, probably not many people will talk to her if she stay at home. But in this game where age, gender is not being labeled, someone somewhere, we don't know which country, helped her and formed an intimate relationship where love suddenly is something that you know, she thought was not possible is coming back to her daily life. Um, I just thought that was something that I never thought a game was supposed to do. Um, uh, this, is, this is the spoiler I'm not going to show you. Uh, I also want to talk about <laughs> sharing developer life. Uh, so we really want our players to know what it's like to be making games. So we recreated one-to-one -one, uh, you know, replica of our office. Uh, and now players are discovering this Easter egg and they start to uh, leaving comments online of visiting our office. Uh, and uh, this uh, so-called uh, corporate slave is actually me. Uh, and if you uh, save me as a star, uh, I'm going to walk to the meeting room and I will, I will be talking about my worries. This is uh, the Chinese player taking uh, the same spirit. I said, you know, we're doomed. We are never going to live up to the journey standard. The player is going to be disappointed. Uh, and uh, I find the player, when they discover these words, they find it quite uh, interesting. Um, and uh, they never thought about that's what the developer is thinking about and worry about day to day. Um, and oh, I want to also share a story of the game Bring People Together. Um, uh, right now, Korea and Japan are having some you know, political uh, fights, uh, but uh, because Sky is a game where you can actually communicate without using language, a lot of the kids between Japan and Korea are talking about forming friendship on Twitter. Um, we also have our first marriage uh, from Sky. Uh, so it started soft launch uh, uh, early 2018. And these two characters find each other, and turns out they're all from Philippines. So they met in real life, and they become a couple. And so now it's almost an anniversary, and they've already engaged. And the funny thing is, we actually uh, captured this post they put on Facebook, and we hand on the wall. Uh, you know, it's right here. And, and after we recreated the office, uh, someone just, uh, the artist was lazy, so he just took the photo and put it in the game. And then uh, on the birthday of, of uh, the boyfriend, she discovered this office, and this is just kind of weird self-referential self uh, uh, thing that happens. Uh, also, this, you know, with the goal of making Sky a game where you can play with family, uh, this is actually eight player playing piggybacking game. Um, we have seen many Japanese players uh, posting, you know, their kids drawing off the sky and their mother was taking their kids to play the game together. Uh, and just last week, uh, we, we, the, the, these mother and daughter visited us and they told us like the grandma, you know, cross three generations and play sky together. Uh, and the last piece, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, deaths. We also have our first sky player who died in real life. Uh, usually you don't hear this story until like years later, but um, I, I just thought the whatever the player writes here says a lot about um, 
how much you can spread light um, and love to each other. Um, and this is a game about building meaningful connections and many of the players now remember this person because he was in the stage for cancer. He can't really move around, so he spent most of his time playing Sky. He doesn't talk much, he just helps people. And now all these players are remembering him. Uh, and he's going to be a permanent star in the sky of these players. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> Awesome.